Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to take simulation nodes up another notch by creating some particle simulations that we could use for things like fireworks or explosions. So let's jump right into it. Like before, we're starting with a mesh object that has a geometry node node tree on it, and that node tree has a simulation zone. Since we want to create a particle system, we're going to need particles to work with. We'll do that by converting our mesh into points. I'll use the point distribute points on faces node. This will give us some good points to work with. This is an area of this process where you have a lot of leeway. You can use this distribute points on faces to get points on the shell of your mesh. However, if you'd rather have the whole area of your mesh filled up, you could first convert your mesh to a volume and then use and then use a point distribute points in volume node instead. Now instead of having a shell of a cube covered with points, I now have a cube-shaped volume filled with points. Obviously, there's a bunch of ways to create point clouds, and you should try out a whole bunch of them to get the types of effects you're looking for. To keep it simple, I'm just going to use the distribute points on faces node. The next thing that we'll need to do is create a way to store the velocity of our points. You can do this by adding a named attribute to your point cloud of type vector, or by adding a state variable to your simulation that's a vector. I haven't discovered yet if there's a benefit to doing it one way or the other. So for this video, we're going to add a variable to our simulation state. With the simulation input selected, I'll go here to node and add to simulation state. I'll change the type to vector and rename it velocity. Since we're going to be modifying this value over time, we'll want to connect this from our input to our output. Next, we're going to want to give our particles some kind of initial velocity. One of the easiest ways is to simply hook up a random value node to your velocity input. And we'll have our values go from negative 1 to positive 1. Now that we've populated this data, we need to have our velocity update the position of our points. Now that we're no longer editing a full object, but instead specific points on that object, we're going to need to use something other than transform geometry. So we'll be using geometry right set position node. The change in position is going to be the velocity added to the position or the velocity used as an offset. I'll play this animation so that you can see what this setup does. Right off the bat, I think that looks pretty cool, but let's keep going. Right now, our velocity is being applied every frame of our animation. Let's say one of our point's velocities is a vector of 100. On frame 1, that point is going to move 1 meter in the x direction. On frame 2, it's going to move another meter in the x direction. And it's going to continue that way. Generally, we don't think of velocities being in distances per frame but instead distances per second, or some other unit of time. Like we've done in the previous videos, we'll go ahead and scale this amount that's being offset of the position by our delta time, which is just the amount of time that's elapsed since the last frame. So to scale this, I'm going to use the utilities vector, vector math node, and set it to scale and then the scale factor will be the delta time. There are some nodes that I find myself adding a lot, and just like with other commands in Blender, you can add these to your quick favorites menu. So the math and vector math nodes are two nodes like that. So I'm going to press Shift A, go down to math, right click, and say add to quick favorites. I'll go up to vector, vector math, and say add to quick favorites. Now if I want to add one of the math nodes, I simply press the Q button. I've got all of these math nodes here, and my vector math node here, with a single keystroke. Let's get back to our particles. Now with our velocity scaled by the delta time, we'll play the animation again. That's a bit more reasonable. 
Now, of course, my default cube is two meters cubed. So I'm going to go into edit mode and scale this down and then bring up my density. You can use this random value node that we've added to tweak the initial directions of our particles. So say for instance, you didn't want the particles to go in the negative Z direction. You could have your minimum Z be zero. And now if I run this, they all go up. And of course I could add more force in the positive Z direction. Next, we're gonna to wanna to add the force of gravity. Just like our initial velocity sets our points moving in a specific direction, gravity also causes things to accelerate. And in this case, we just want that force of gravity to be going in the negative Z direction. So how do we do that? When in free fall, until reaching some sort of terminal velocity, you will continue to accelerate, which means Whatever that rate of acceleration is, that gets added to your acceleration every second. The acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. In terms of our simulation, that simply means that every second we need to add negative 9.8 to the z component of our velocity. So I'm going to add a vector math node, and it's already set to add. Now, I could just type in negative 9.8 here, but just like before, that would be added on every frame, which would make the acceleration way too fast. We have to scale the value by delta time. So I'll duplicate this scale node, connect it here, connect my delta time scaling, and put in my gravity of negative 9.8 meters per second. So this means that every frame I'm getting that fractional amount of 9.8 added to my downward acceleration. Then one frame's worth of my downward acceleration offsets my point positions. Let's run this and see how it looks. You will notice that some of the particles immediately are going downward. That's because our minimum Z velocity is zero. So on the very first frame, when the force of gravity gets applied to our points, it's going to be moving downward. So we might want our minimum velocity to be a little higher so that all the particles start with an upward velocity. And of course we can widen the X and Y values to make it spread out more to the sides. We'll do negative three and positive three. That's looking great. Now these are some settings that you might want to move out to your modifier. Things like the density and your minimum and maximum velocities. If you wanted extra control, you could also bring out the force of gravity. Say if you wanted it to be applied in a different direction. For now, we're just gonna leave this hard-coded into our node tree. Now that we have that, we want our particles to stop when they hit the ground plane or where z is equal to zero. We can do this by deleting the points once they cross zero on the z-axis. So I'll simply add a geometry, delete geometry node, and my selection is going to be when the position of my points z component is less than or equal to zero. To do that, I'll add a position node so we can read the position. I'll pull out a separate XYZ node. I'll pull out a less than or equal to node. By default, it's set to zero. And then I'll use that result as my delete geometry selection. There. Right now, everything is based around the fact that my default cube was centered at the world origin. If I were to move the whole object up, and not just the vertices and leave the center point at the world origin, and I run this simulation now, you'll see that when I reference zero here for the position, it's relative to the position of my original modified object.
but I want this to be relative to the world origin. What that means is I'm going to have to add the position of my original object to my position to get my position in world space. For that, I'll need to reference my original object. That's done with a node called self object. This is a reference to the object that has the modifier applied to it. You see that this object is an orange output, so it's an object reference. We'll drag this out and add an object info node. And then of course, the object info node has the location of that object. So from here, I can use a vector math node to add the position of my points to the location of my self object. So now let's run this simulation and see how it looks. There. That's what we were going for. Let's add one more feature to this explosion for now. I want to be able to turn this explosion on at a given keyframe. To do that, I'm going to add a switch node between my simulation output and my group output. I want my explosion to happen when my switch is true, so I'll plug my simulation output into the true input. So now if I run my animation, nothing happens. Since this switch is turned off, it's getting this empty false input. Now I do want my initial cube to show here, not my particles. So I can take my group input and duplicate it and drag it over and plug my original geometry into my false socket. If I turn the switch on, you'll see that it changes to the initial placement of my points. With the switch on, if I play my animation, I get the same thing as before. With my switch off, if I play my animation, I get nothing. But now if I turn my switch on during my animation, I get my explosion at the point where it turns on. What's also interesting, if I turn it off and on multiple times during the animation, it will restart the simulation. This tells me that if a simulation zone is not connected to the output, it's not evaluated at all. And it's on the first frame that it's connected to the output that the whole process is kicked off. I'll connect my, I'll connect my switch to my group input. I'll rename it explode and I'll rename these velocities as well. So now over here in my modifier panel, I can very easily affect my explosion. We're going to continue this explosion particle system in the next video. We'll talk about adding trails as well as customized ground that can follow a shape instead of just being at a flat surface as well as a few other goodies. So be on the lookout for that video. I hope you're finding this series helpful, and I hope you learn a thing or two about simulation nodes. I want to give a quick shout out to all my Patreon supporters who are making content like this possible. If you want to join my Patreon, the link for that's down in the description. Again, I hope this inspires you to make something awesome. And until next time, I'll catch you later.